We're all about back to basics coming up next. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to Garden to Table. If you're like me, the idea of simplicity is very compelling. That's why I decided to center this show around Back to Basics. And that's why we're here in this beautiful place. This is Canterbury, New Hampshire, and we're here at the Shaker Village. You see, this place is well over 200 years old, has a fascinating history, and much of it is centered around the production of food and the enjoyment of food. Today, the Shaker Village is beautifully restored there are over 20-something buildings, gardens, and all sorts of things to see. But I find it fascinating that at its peak in the 19th century, there were over 300 members who lived here on this property, and they farmed around 3,000 acres. To get greater insight into the Shakers, come on over here. I want you to meet Kate Brown. Alan, the building behind us is the Meeting House. It is the oldest building in the village. It was built in 1792 when the Canterbury Shakers first uh, settled here. I see, and so they, they originally came from England, didn't That's they? That's true. They, they came from Manchester, England. Um, the religion was established in 1747, and uh, it was an offshoot of the Quaker Society. They, um, they immigrated to America due to a lot of religious persecution in 1774, two years before the American Revolution. There was a band of nine Shakers that came over with the, uh, what we attribute to be the founder of the religion, Mother Ann Lee. It eventually grew to 5,000 people by about the mid-1800s. So as we look back on the Shakers, I mean, they really did have a progressive way of thinking about a lot of things, didn't they? Oh, absolutely, they did, Alan. The, the Shakers were a Christian, communal, celibate society, um, but they believed in equal rights for men and women and for all races. Um, so for every person in this village, um, men and women had equal votes on, on what happened in the village, and they didn't live in the same part of any house. In fact, if you go into the dwelling house, you'll find two stairways in there, one for the brothers and one for the sisters. So they never even used the same stairway, and they never even entered a building through the same doorway. So in a sense, they were were separation of the sexes, but they were very unified um, in, in terms of living together in a single dwelling house and worshiping together in a single meeting house. Well, they certainly are famous even to this day for their quality of craftsmanship uh, and also the the food that they produce. Oh, absolutely, yes. I think I think many people think of the Shakers for their furniture, but if you come here and you have a Shaker-inspired meal, you'll realize that Shakers were very creative in their cooking. Their use of um, herbs and vegetables, uh, herbs for uh, just delicate spice of, of foods. Um, so they were very creative in their cooking. and. Um, the land here in, in New Hampshire is pretty rough. It uh, have a lot of rocks. They had to clear the fields, establish the gardens. You can see the results of their clearing the fields and the stone walls that surround the property. It, exactly. If you go all throughout New England, you'll find stone walls everywhere. The, the stone walls are certainly a hallmark of New England. Oh, absolutely. And we have some magnificent stone walls here. See what the Shakers have growing in their garden. So originally they would have this whole area would have been all vegetable. So they need to grow everything they need for the summer. They're going to have lots of fresh fruits and vegetables. And in the winter they're going to can and preserve everything so they can keep it. Because they can't run to the supermarket if they run out of food. So let's see, we've got, we've got beans and we've got, anyone know what this is? Orange carrots, exactly. <laughs> and we've got onions and we've got some parsley and some eggplants. Let's go out and see if we can find some carrots to pull. Are they ready? Yep, they're nice and ready. Let's find a nice carrot, this one. We're gonna grab it right down around the stem and you're gonna, can you pull it out? Yay, nice carrot. Let's find another one for your sister. There we go. 
What a lovely carrot. Are they good? Yeah. It's like nice and carroty. Galen, this is one of the most important areas uh, here at the Shaker Village. I mean, from the very beginning, it was hugely important. This, this three acre field that you see here was the first vegetable garden. Really? So from 1793, they were farming here and they were raising three acres of vegetables. That's huge. It is huge, it is huge. And they were doing it all with animal power as people would come by to see what they were doing they'd say, gee, that looks nice. Mm -hmm. Can I have that? How'd you yeah. do that? Because the Shakers were always- And they would sell it to them. Yeah. yeah, oh, absolutely. Because as much as they wanted to be self-sufficient, they couldn't. Um, in New England, it's really hard to be self-sufficient. So they knew that from the beginning and from the beginning, they were selling people things. Well, they were really quite masterful at taking the commodities that they grew and in some way adding value to that product. They were, they were masters at it. They, they always thought that way because they needed a little extra cash all the time. And they were selling the dried plants, but then they realized that if they sold them to the pharmaceutical market, that's where the market was. That's where the money was. So the shakers comp took their herbs, dried them, compressed them into bricks and then they took them to Boston to sell, and they would take them to the ph pharmaceutical companies. They would not mess around with little sales. Sure. They would go for the big sales. Go direct. Yeah. T correct me if I'm wrong, one of the first industries, if you will, that they set up right here was seed saving. They did, yes. That's a very early industry. And they did it for their, for their own use, so that they could have seeds mm. for the mm. following year, which everybody was doing but the Shakers were doing it better. Mm -hmm. And seed saving is a huge production, particularly if you have a three acre garden. Mm -hmm. So some huge in the sense that a lot of the vegetables they were growing were biennial. They would set seeds the second year. So in the fall, they would dig up the cabbages, the brassicas, and they would haul them into the cellars of these buildings and keep them over the really? winter. Yeah, and then they would take them out, replant them the next year to get the seeds. Um, it was very labor intensive. And it took and a great deal of organization, didn't it, to keep all of those varieties separate? Oh yeah. yeah. But they had they had printing presses here. They were all set up for commerce. So the seed industry, when they weren't working on the seeds, they were printing the labels. They started to produce these little seed bags, little seed uh, papers and they had the printing press to make them, so they would just crank them out. And because they were communal, because there were some 22 um, villages, if you were running low on cabbage seed, you could just write a letter to, your, to the Shaker Village in Massachusetts and say, oh, send me your cabbage seeds. I really need right. that. Right, we're low this yeah. year. We'll happily give you marigold seed right. or something like that. So what they were able to do was become, that is how they created their, their reputation for being reliable. Mm. So they never ran out, and everybody else ran out <laughs> yeah, because they could not operate on this kind of scale. Galen, thank you so much. It's thank been you. marvelous. Yeah, yeah, it has been great. Thank you for coming. Have I got a recipe for you. This is one that comes from my family. I got it from my aunt. We've enjoyed it for generations. It's a corn pudding, and it takes advantage of farm fresh corn. Let me show you how I started. Now, what I'm gonna do here is take six ears of corn and steam it. This is the last ear here. You can see there are five ears of corn that have already been cut off the cob. I'm just gonna move this out of the way show you how to take this corn off the cob. You just want to take it and cut it 
like that. You don't want to cut into the cob. You just want to take the kernel off. Then in a moment, we'll milk it. Just cut the kernels off like this. It smells really, really good. The aroma of the sweet corn is just divine. You just about got it all off here. There you go. And then I just take the knife and I want to milk all that juice out just like this. There you go. Got a little bit here on the end. Don't want to waste a single kernel. All right. Throw this over here in the sink. Now, what I want to do, because I like this creamy, I want to take two cups of the corn. I'm going to put it in the food processor. Part of the recipe will use some of the whole corn, but two cups of this I'm going to put in here to make to chop this up a little bit. I'm just going to pulse it Oops, here. Not too much, you see, just enough to give it. All right, so that's done. Okay, now I'm going to take this half and half, the two cups in there. I'm going to take one tablespoon of cornstarch, and I just want to make sure that that's completely dissolved in the half and half. I'm going to make sure that it's all whisked together around the sides like this. Yes, half and half. I didn't say this would fit a diet. It's very good though. And then two tablespoons of chives. And half a teaspoon of white pepper. Okay, before we go a little further, I'm going to get my eggs ready. So I'm going to use four eggs. I love using our eggs. Just look how dark that yolk is. Really beautiful. Got a little bit of shell there. These eggs are laid by some of our heritage birds. These were gathered this morning and I think these came out of the New Hampshire red pen. Just look at that. Isn't that beautiful? And one more. I'm just going to take these four eggs and make sure that the egg yolk and the white is all mixed together like this. And then just pour that in. Make a nice binder. And to finish it off and make it really good, we're going to add a half a stick of salted butter that is melted. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is what will bind the corn pudding together. Okay, now it's time to add the corn. And I'm going to take this corn that I have put through the food processor, take it, I'm going to add it first. Look at that. It smells so fresh. Put that in like this. Mix it thoroughly. And then I'm going to add what's left of the corn, which should be about a cup. So I've got one more. Well, I've got a little more. That's all right. I don't want to waste any of it. So there's one more cup. So you see you have three cups. You could stop here, but look, I don't have much left, and I just want to go ahead and use the rest of it. So it's probably a half of a cup left. So there's, there's some flexibility here. Now some just use all whole corn. Uh, my aunt does that, but I actually prefer you know, at least half of it chopped up like I showed you. Now what I'm gonna do is just take this and pour it into an eight by eight baking dish that I've oiled. And then this will cook at 350 for about 30 to 40 minutes. What, do you, what you wanna make sure is that it's baked all the way around in the center, it just jiggles just a little bit. You can take it out and it will continue to cook. I tell you, when you try this, you're gonna love it. It's one of those great back to basics dishes for the summer. The Shakers are famous for many things, but certainly most of us know them for their furniture. Blending celebrated and unique design with high quality workmanship. But unlike furniture styles that attempt to win you over with fancy millwork and detailed carvings, Shaker furniture style is known for the exact opposite. 
Inspired by the ascetic religious beliefs of their society, their designs were simple and utilitarian. On the other hand, it's exactly that modest yet beautiful look of Shaker furniture that's responsible for making it so popular with American homeowners and designers alike. Many examples of Shaker furniture survive and are preserved today, including some popular forms of tables and cabinets. Of all the styles and forms of Shaker furniture, I suppose the Shaker chair is the most admired and famous. Originally designed, Shaker chairs were the best example of Shaker faith expressed through wood. Their crafting and molding remained perhaps at the highest peak in Shaker style furniture, and these chairs are much prized by antique collectors today. Another sought after furniture form are Shaker cabinets. The principal focus of the design here too was the desire for order and simplicity. You see, Shaker bedroom furniture makers made their cabinets, chest of drawers, blanket chests, and storage chests in small numbers. These were made in workshops all by hand and with unfailing attention to detail. Shakers made furniture for their own use as well as for sale to the general public. Although the original furniture is now less commonly seen, it's a style that's very much in demand. This has given rise to an increasing number of manufacturers basing furniture around Shaker designs, which are now mass produced and readily available. Shakers are often mistakenly thought to be Luddites, like the Amish, but nothing could be further from the truth. The Shakers have always embraced technology and welcomed any innovation that saved time, which they believe belonged to God. Their inventions numbered in the hundreds, many of which we still take for granted today, including the creation of the flat broom. This is the carpenter's shop at the Shaker Village, and in this shop, they make brooms. Now, you may think, hmm, what an interesting tool, pretty simple. But, you know, the Shakers were very inventive people. In fact, they came up with the broom that we all know today. Before this model of the broom was introduced, people used round brooms. And the Shakers are credited with improving the shape of the broom by creating this flattened broom. In fact, in 1830, they sold 30,000 brooms across the country. Now, that's a lot of brooms of this new improved model. They also grew their own broom corn and that's what makes up the bristles of the broom. In fact, they had their own special variety that they grew that produced a bristle that would last much, much longer. The great news is that they're still creating these beautiful brooms right here with the same level of craftsmanship they did a century and a half ago. I don't know about you, but I love the flavor of eggs, particularly fresh eggs. Now here on my farm, we have the benefit of eating them very fresh. Just a few interesting things about eggs. You know, eggs are very porous, or at least the shell is. And when the hen lays the egg, there's a very thin membrane that's on that egg called the bloom. Now that has antibacterial properties. And it's interesting because when I was a little kid, I remember my great grandparents at their farm having eggs sitting out on the counter and it seemed like they were out there for weeks. I asked my aunt about this and she said, yes, they didn't refrigerate eggs. In fact, they just collected them and placed them in the kitchen unwashed. And then when my great grandmother got ready to use them, she would wash them then and then apply them to whatever recipe she was preparing. So by leaving that bloom on, the egg actually lasts longer. Washing it takes the bloom off. So if you're buying eggs in the grocery store, you should pay attention to the expiration date. Now, of course, these eggs have been washed, so you don't want to leave them out on the counter. You want to put them in the refrigerator, and if you do, they'll last up to three to five weeks. Brown eggs versus white eggs, well, they're both nutritionally the same. The only difference is the shell color, which is dictated by the breed that laid the egg. <laughs> Let's take a look at Shaker furniture at work. 
This is the church family dining room at the Canterbury Shaker Village. And what's interesting about their dining customs is the Shakers dined separately. The brothers and sisters dine at separate parts of the dining room. This is set for an 1850 table setting. If you look closely, you'll notice the simplicity of the plates, the flatware, and the glassware. And the table is set for 12 places. This table is set with three different units of four. And what you have here are the four plates, of course. And then in the center, you would have the uh, condiments and the serving pieces for those four participants at a particular meal. The meals were served family style, and the menu was based on what was in season from the gardens and farm or what they had preserved and stored away for the winter. During mealtime, the Shakers dined in silence with one member of the society either reading from scripture or the news. For the most part, meals were served with this level of simplicity, but for special occasions and holidays, such as Christmas, they did adorn the table with decorations. They took dining and their food very seriously. In fact, the phrase, shake your plate, came from the idea that you could take what you want, but you better eat what you take. Sounds like the way I was raised as a kid. Adam, I gotta tell you, that meal that you served last night, the lamb was fantastic. Do you okay. mind helping me understand the preparation for not only that, but the entire meal? Because I thought the potatoes and peas was excellent. Sure. Well, first I had this great piece of lamb, seasoned with some, some salt and freshly ground black pepper. Now, did you dry the, the lamb off first before you put the, pep the salt on it? Yeah, you always want to kind of dry it off a little bit first. Yeah. It, it helps it uh, sear a lot better. Seared it in the pan with some butter. So once it was done searing in, in the butter, I took it off. I, I smeared some, uh, some honey crunch mustard on it. And then I had some great savory that I picked from the garden. Now, now what made the, the, the mustard honey crunch? Because I know you can get uh, honey mustard. Well, it's, it's honey mustard and it has um, whole mustard seeds in it. Oh, I could detect that in the crunch. It made it really extra crispy. I think the texture of this dish is what's so wonderful. Yeah, that, that was kind of the idea. So once I had the mustard on, I put some uh, summer savory with some uh, panko breadcrumbs, put it in that, and then I cooked in the oven for about, about 10 minutes to 350 degrees. It's a nice medium rare because if you overcook lamb, it's just, it's not very good. Yeah, yeah. Well, now, the, the lamb was fantastic and it wasn't overcooked at all. Tell me about the sauce because the, those cherries were wonderful. Those are uh, dried cherries. It's a very simple sauce. It's vinegar, dried cherries with a little uh, clove, cinnamon, and just kind of put those in a pot and, and let them simmer for about 10 minutes and they kind of make a nice thick sauce. So I could, I could do this at home and just cook it down to sort of the thickness that I want. Yeah. And it sounds like I could use any dried fruit if I wanted to use apricot and make it, yeah, very good. It just depends. I, I really like the uh, the cherries because they're, they're a little sour. Yeah, it was a wonderful contrast, wonderful contrast. And tell me about those, those peas and potatoes because I, I assume they came from right here at the Shaker Village. They, they did. They're actually uh, Adirondack potatoes, so they have a really neat kind of red flesh. And uh, so I boil those off first in some salted water. And the peas I kept raw because they only take like two minutes to cook. Yeah, it didn't take long at all. So I had some great local bacon, sauteed that off so it's nice and crispy. Threw in a little bit of onion, and then I threw in the potatoes and the peas, a little bit of heavy cream, and just let that reduce down for like two minutes, and, and that was it. So it's really quite simple. Well, I really appreciate you sharing the recipe with me. I love lamb, and I'm going to try it when I get home. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Pleasure. I hope you've enjoyed this brief glimpse into an aspect of American culture. You know, the Shakers and this Shaker village continue to remind us of the virtues of simplicity and getting back to the basics. Until next time, good eating and good health.